about a game. It's a red skin. Hello and welcome back to another live mock and in this mock I'll be talking with Lavanya and she is an experienced uh, Java developer and hopefully we're gonna have great fun you know um, I'll be, I'll be speci especially having great fun interviewing uh, Lavanya and hopefully that's gonna be um, you know finding it helpful and obviously I'll be covering a wide range of questions in Java, Spring, Spring Boot, Hibernate, JPA, and many more. Okay, so let's start the interview, and I hope you guys are excited, and I am too. All right, so let's get started. All right, so let's start with the interview. I have Lavinia with me, and uh, welcome, Lavinia. Welcome back. And for the first time, we'll not be having a lesson, we'll be having a mock. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, Lavanya. So, I just want, okay, before we get started with anything, I want you to introduce yourself a little bit, like about your experience, uh, the things that you are learning, and um, obviously, you know, basically tell a little bit about your past experience and everything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, I have around six and a half years of experience in service side development. Mm -hmm. I have knowledge on Java programming language and Spring modules like Spring Core, Spring MVC, Spring Boot, uh, Spring JPA, and Hibernate the web services. Yeah, cool. Yeah, and you skipped a lot of different things. I want to add like YAML, Timely, JPA. Yeah, so that's okay. So basically, um, the thing is like you are like you know having a complete hands-on experience with java spring hibernate this is your main profile of right what we have discussed previously and obviously i'll be start asking you questions on this right now so yeah so in which module you want me to get started spring spring all right um why not from java Lavanya? okay this time i'll do the reverse i'll not i'll not start asking from spring okay, okay. We'll start from a very easy question, as I have said, right? Uh, so we'll be start asking easy questions first, then we'll go, you know, little, little in depth later on. So, yeah. And one thing, guys, I will not be asking anything to Lavanya, which I have already asked to other candidates. If I have taken mock and posted on Vimeo in your paid playlist or in your free playlist on the YouTube. So I'll not be asking those questions to Lavanya. It's going to be uh, some new questions, which we have not covered earlier. So, yeah, Lavanya. So, yeah, so I just want to get started with marker interface. So tell me, what do you mean by a marker interface in Java? And what do you think we need it in our real-time Java programming? Okay. So marker interface is an interface which actually doesn't have any methods or constants defined in it. It actually gives an additional information or a kind of metadata about a class which has implemented this marker interface. There are many built-in marker interface like serializable and clonable. So, explain. So, in a class that is a clonable interface, we can override a method called clone in the object method in the object class. So. That means we can create a copy. For example, if we have a student class and we have implemented this clonable interface, we would be able to override this clone method. So in that, with the help of this clone method, we can easily create a object, similar objects which we have created for a student class. So basically it will create only a shallow copy, not a deep one. It will try to create only a student object, all the user defined inside dependent objects are not created. It will be pointing to the old object only. Yes, mm -hmm. you, you just said that clonable is a marker interface and we don't have any methods defined or any constant mm -hmm. defined in that particular. Yeah, so you said a couple of things. Maybe you said about clonable and maybe we have serializable interface, right? Yes. You, yes. If you are learning Spring Data JPA, you know the root interface repository like JPA repository, CRUD repository, and this extends to repository. That is also a marker interface. No methods inside that. I just have one question here, Lavanya. Why do we need marker interface if there is no methods inside it? There is no constants inside it. What do you think is needed? 
actually it adds a special features like we can make use of the functionality like clone if we uh, see the clonable interface uh, we can you make use of this clone method but when we don't have this uh, method uh, the clonable interface implemented to a class we might not be able to create object likewise uh, this can be even achieved with the help of annotation these days okay. but uh, even the yeah. marker interface annotation is a replacement for this but yeah a marker interface is like you know it has its own functionality like uh, i can use a led tv as my monitor okay. but it cannot do the work of an actual monitor right mm, yes sir yes 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 yeah, yes, so, yes. so the thing is like you know we need to do a runtime check right if this class or this object i am getting and this object is a you know Uh, instance of that uh, you know it is implementing that particular interface, interface. so instance of that interface then only i will need to do some operations for an example imagine you got some uh, methods someone tell you to create some methods and that that method need to do something but we need to only perform some operation when it is a instance of that interface, interface. right or that object so that yes. check jvm can do using the it can do a instance of check Uh, and can see whether we are implementing that one and guys who are watching this video i will not be going in depth of that i'll not be asking um, labanya some more questions but maybe your inter interviewer also can counter you over here like um, if labanya if there is um, like you know if we have a marco interface right and why don't you think the same functionality can be done by a normal interface also we can do the same thing in the normal interface right so do you know the answer for this no gosh like uh, yes we can do it but even mm -hmm. for example if a, um, no gosh we can we can achieve the same thing achieve but there are problems it. yep that problem you guys need to find out tell me in the comment section okay and me and lavanya will be discussing in the end of the interview right not right now okay um all right lavanya comfortable right now you are becoming yes. comfortable yes yeah. sir sure <laughs> the next question yeah i have written few questions for you um okay let me just ask you some easy questions because i have written down some of the easy questions to make you comfortable first because i want you to speak a lot of different things with me okay, okay. Uh, tell me five different exceptions in spring okay that you usually encounter in your day to day project i'm putting myself on mute go ahead okay so the main uh, exception class of spring is spring beam creation exception this basically occurs when uh, for instance if i take another exception like no such beam definition exception so this exception occurs when we don't have any spring beam which we have auto wired in an another class so spring tries to find the definition of that class and try to inject in that uh, auto wire uh, auto wire dependency so in this case if the beam is not uh, available in the container it will throw a no such beam definition exception this one will occur the yeah. next one what i see is non unique beam definition exception for example if we have a interface my interface and we have two implementation class for this interface and mm -hmm. we have a class a and that class we ha it has an auto wired dependency of this inter interface so both the classes is annotated with the, the both the class which is implementing this in interface is annotated with at the rate service or at the rate component so two beams will be created of type my interface so the spring get confused which one to auto wire here so in order to overcome this what we can do is there are two ways one is to use at the rate qualifier telling the reference name Perfect. to it Mm -hmm. or you can make one of the service to act as primary always so this okay. is another exception that i see the next exception is beam in creation exception number 3 so 
number three. Yeah, so this yeah. ex this exception will come when there are circular dependencies between any two classes. For example, if we have employee and department, employee has a dependency of department and department has a dependency of employee. And both are uh, created using constructor uh, injection. Okay. So in this case, employee will be in search of dep department and department will be in search of employee. So there are ways we should not, you make uh, circular dependencies in our project. So we can have certain principles to follow. And there are a few methods to over overcome this kind of circular dependencies. And next one, the fourth one I see is being instantiation exception. For example, if we have... Um, a class which is abstract mm -hmm. and if we try to uh, annotate it with other service or if we try to define it by ourselves using other eight bean in the configuration class at that time during the application startup it tells bean instantiation exception The fifth one I would like to tell it from boot uh, okay. so application context exception. So this okay. exception will come when we miss at the rate enable auto configuration in the boot because mm -hmm. the framework will try to create uh, the servlet container. context container, servlet container object, but mm -hmm. without this annotation, it will not be able to. Uh, uh, create one so it will throw this exception telling us whether we have to create a object or add the other in the good job Lalan. such a detailed explanation thank you very much i don't think i have to add any slides with this explanation isn't it so anyhow thank you very much for the detailed explanation Lavinia. but i i'll try to put some of the slides so that if you guys want to utilize it i'll tell Lavinia only to give me the code and i'll be pasting it over here okay all right cool All right, next easy question. Okay, I'll, I'll give you a lollipop kind of question. Uh, tell me five spring annotations. Okay. 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 Uh, tell me five spring annotations that you have used in your spring. Conditional, that is a star mark here. Okay. You don't need to tell me any of the stereotype annotations, excluding the stereotype annotation. Tell me five spring annotations that you have used. Oh, stereotype in the sense uh the the basic annotations you, you i don't want to tell that yeah, yeah that's why I, i've added this word stereotype now you need to tell me what do you mean by stereotype what are the stereotype annotations stereotype lavanya like the annotation uh, which, and save the bin like at the red component repository points, so. yeah the okay. component scanning eligible component repository service yeah. service uh, controller, controller. And also and don't tell me annotation which has the component inbuilt like uh, rest controller or controller advice or uh, configuration. These annotations already have, you know, component in, inbuilt, right? They're okay. embedded to comp uh, component annotation. So don't tell me any stereotype annotations. Uh, tell me all the annotations as, like, you know, excluding all these things. Yeah. Can I tell no repository being? Yeah, 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 yeah. Why not? Yes. Okay. So, iterate no repository bean. So, we annotate this bean whenever we don't uh, want that class to be picked up by the container and instantiate it. Can you take all the uh, get mapping, post mapping, all these kinds? Yeah, yeah. Why not? Yeah, get mapping, post mapping. Just tell me only one. Then put mapping, delete mapping. No, Pilar. Okay. So, iterate uh, put mapping. I'll take this um, and. 
we have um, many many annotations other it boot uh, other it's uh, data jpa test other it boot no i should not tell that then, then that's mm -hmm. fine you keep on telling i know you know many at the rate data jpa test i'll be accepting it I at the rate spring boot configuration at the rate spring boot application uh, at the rate i should not tell at the rate configuration at the rate bean uh, at the rate scope uh, at the rate um, at the rate what i'll be telling you that? i'll be giving you okay. hint tell me three annotations from spring aop okay at the rate aspect uh, mm -hmm. at the rate point cut uh, mm -hmm. At rate point cut and uh, at the rate transactional, we can uh, at the rate transactional, at the rate after, yes. before, at the rate after, at the rate around, at the rate around, yes, uh, before, okay. at the rate, yes. Okay. That's it, that's it. Okay, tell me three annotations from Spring Security. Security, at the rate secured, at the rate pre authorized, at the rate post authorized. Perfect. At the rate enable Spring Web and sorry, Spring Web Security. Uh, web Security, at the rate enable Web Security. Perfect. We can keep on I am pretty much okay. I know you, you know about all these things. Okay. Now, let me ask you a very easy question. You just told me about Etheret no repository being as the first annotations. Okay. Before, before I tell you to explain me that thing, Lavanya, tell me one thing. Do we need to write a at repository annotations whenever you are using Spring Data Jeffy? For an example, the way you want to, uh, you know, uh, have a class which is a, which is going to give you all the prod feature inbuilt in Spring Boot. What we do, we use the Data JPA project. We add the Spring Data JPA as the starter, and we're going to say we will be creating an interface. We'll extend that to JPA repository or prod repository or uh, what we have, like in you know, a paging or, or sorting repository okay. or blah, blah, right? And on top of that interface, do we really need to write a at the rate repository annotation? If yes, why? If no, why? Question is clear? Yes, yeah. yes. Tell me first. Uh, yeah. So first we don't annotate the interface with at the rate repository. Mm -hmm. So basically uh, what the Spring uh, Boot does with this dependency added is, we have uh, at the rate enable auto configuration run in background. There is a generic class implementation for all the repositories, what you have told, like JPA repository. The main one is the CRUD one, which mm -hmm. has child uh, sorting and paging repositories and JPA repositories. So this has a generic implementation of CRUD repository or JPA repository. So that mm -hmm. class would have annotated with at the rate repository. And this class, what we write, will rely on that. Mm -hmm. That uh, the, the bean which is created by the generic implementations of this CRUD repository will be mm -hmm. injected with the dependencies of our uh, classes, which has what to the repository, custom repository that we created. So it is not necessary to add at the rate repository on interface, only with the class. Secondly, um, at this point, I'm not a little clear, Lavanya. I, I understand what you said. So are you trying to say that, okay, we already have our dependency in place, correct, Lavanya? So let's say data JPA dependency, I added to my project. Now I'm creating a, a interface, let's say some XYZ interface, which is extending to JPA repository, yeah. all right? Now, in my interface, I don't need to write a at repository annotation, correct? Yes. Because it will be automatically detectable because Spring Boot will automatically detect uh, the JPA related uh, stuff because our interface is already extending to that one. So there is no need to write the at repository annotation on top of our interface. interface. Correct? People, yes. I have seen people that keep on using at the rate repository annotation on top of the interface. Do we need to really add it? No. But is it really required? Uh, no, it's not required, right? Yes, because yes, at the day, Lavanya, even though you are writing at the rate repository annotation on top of that particular interface, the implementation we will not be generating. Okay. Implementation Spring Boot will be generated, right? So Spring Boot will be generating the implementation for that particular interface, will give us all the cron feature. Is this leads to me? My next question, tell me. What is the difference between JPA repository, CRUD repository, 
um, your um, paging and sorting repository. Tell me the hierarchy and tell me a little about Spring Data JPF project that we have, right? So, yeah, keep on sharing your thoughts on that. Yeah. Okay. So, base repository is a repository, which is a marker interface. And the next layer is CRUD repository, wherein we have all the CRUD related utility methods create, update, save. And the next interface is paging and sorting repositories. And this repository will have a utility method related to sorting and pagination. And the next oh. repository is JPA repository. This JPA repository will have uh, all the methods like get, find, um, and delete in batch, uh, or save all and flush. All these kinds of utility methods will be available in the JPA repository. This is the hierarchy. Okay. And uh, when we create a JPA project, you're asking about the JPA project, Abhilash? Yeah, just tell me a little bit about the data JPA. Like, you know, why do we need that? What's spring? Whatever you told is perfectly, that's the thing that I want to hear, Lavinia. You said repository. This is one. Then we have a uh, card repository. Then we have uh, paging and sorting. This is the base, right? Repository, or oh, sorry, if your interface does not need or, the, or if you want to generate something which does not need any CRUD feature, directly extend it to repository. If you need only the CRUD feature, only extend it to CRUD repository. If you need paging and sorting and everything, then you extend it to the paging and sorting repository, right? Okay. Now you are saying JPA repository, right? Okay. Where comes the JPA repository is coming from? It's coming from the Spring Data project, right? What is Spring Data Lavanya? Okay, normally if we create any uh, project that has some relationship with the database, we create the interface and we give the implementation class of that interface and try to connect up with the database. For example, if oh. we say a raw JDBC application or even the Spring JDBC, we write the queries, we open um, our data source, the connection, and we save everything and we close the connection and uh, uh, and. Uh, close the connection and make the transaction to be done safely. But here in Spring Data, it is a, a layer in between the uh, the provider implementations, the data implementations and the database. We rely here and the Spring Data JPA, the next layer, the next layer is the JPA provider layer. The next one is the database. So this what Spring Data JPA gives us it gives us basically data initialization, first point. The second one, it gives utility methods, which based on our entities that we create, it automatically understands whatever the method that we write, and it executes the query with the help of the JPA provider. The default JPA provider is Hibernate. What is the default? What is the, oh, yeah, Hibernate. Hibernate, Hibernate. is the default. Perfect. default. This is what, yeah, go ahead. This is what I wanted to hear. Go ahead. Love so again. the mm -hmm. next point is it's with the help of this enable auto configuration, which is a beautiful feature wherein it creates the entity manager, basically the session of the persistence context. And uh, next one is entity manager factory with the help of all the data source details that we give, it automatically creates the factory and gives us the uh, the entity manager object whenever it is needed. The next point is the transaction. It takes care of the transactions as well. We just uh, we just extend one repository that is called JPA repository. With the help of that, uh, we can create our own functions for it with uh, with the default name find by or get by followed by the, the column name. Stuff. But the JPA repository gives us all this find all, find, find by ID, delete find by ID, all these methods, right? Lavana is my screen stuck. got stuck. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. one second, please. Seconds. It's fine right now, Lavana? Yes, now it's okay, but last 30 I, seconds you lost. Oh, I told you the no reason. You know, it was <laughs> thunderstorm it's and cyclone. Thunderstorm. Right now, I'm in my native Lebanon. It's like a little far from the city, and it's kind of a hilly area, a beautiful place to stay. But in summer, right, in the evening, specifically, um, I, the, there was no internet. And it's just oh. right now, it's, it's blinking. That's why I connected with my internet and also my mobile internet. So if anything goes down, one will pick up. Or anything will happen, I know you are available. We can connect again. Okay, anyhow. Yes, yes. Here, one thing only I wanted to ask you that point that you have added here. The JPA repository is giving us all those implementation and the default provider is here, Hibernate. 
right this is one actual point i want to hear because this, if you are using instead of spring data jpa if someone wants to put spring data mongo dependency mm -hmm. for mongo db data is a framework which is a abstraction abstraction for any database api which want to connect to your application right spring has a abstraction under the data umbrella we have jdbc we have hibernate mybetis mongodb cassandra um, so and so so let's say you are the three and three interface you have said repository jpa repository and one more paging and correct. sorting repository paging correct. yeah sorry sorry repository cloud repository and paging and sorting repository these are the three base and then if you are using spring data jpa then your jpa repository comes in with the default provider is hibernate if it is um, if it is a mongo repository then same thing your mongo your mongo you will be extending to the mongo one and the mongo one will be extending to the paging and sorting then cloud repository then the data repository jpa repository for hibernate that's why we have mongo repository for mongodb right MongoDB. But that three interface that you have explained that lavanya has explained is very very important that is the best so maybe people will ask you so many questions on this so be sure you understand this now lavanya let's come back to the next point now you told me that if you want to create any functionality just create a interface and extend it to jpa repository things will work fine no need to write at the rate repository it will spring will automatically detect the data jpa project and it will bootstrap your application it will create the implementation of your interface and you just need to use the methods i'm absolutely yes. agreeing on that now the next question now uh, if you want to go for jpa repository or cloud repository okay or paging and sorting repository you're going to be seeing an annotation called at the rate no repository bin explain me the reason why they are writing that or can i write it in my own classes let's say i have an interface let's say xyz extends to jpa repository can i put at the rate no repository bin on top of that particular interface yes or no tell me the reason Yes, yes, Abhilash. Like we can even add the no repository bin to our class, which actually extends the JPA repository. When we are adding that, we will not be any um, the bin of that interface will never be instantiated with any implementation classes available here. Though we have implementations of this JPA repository, that will not be uh, instant. That will not be assigned to that interface. So we will not be able to use that. Uh, the utility methods of this jpa repository for example if we have a class and that class has extended the jpa repository consider the parent class has extended the jpa repository i have some few utility methods defined and we have a child repository that extends this parent repository so i have defined some of the utility methods also in it so at times i feel this child repository need not to be instantiated the Perfect. parent repository is itself is fine to uh, is enough to uh, consume all all the utility methods given by jpa so at the time what i do i will add at the rate no repository bean on top of this child repository so the the spring container will never pick up this repository and create a bean for it and uh, there will not be we cannot un, un, uh, un, uh, add a, this add as add this class as dependency to any other project perfect perfect level and this is one line i want to hear from you if you do not want to initialize an interface or you don't want to create an object for that interface because runtime spring only give you the interface implementation correct level so yes, if yes. you don't want spring to create a implementation for that you don't want to initialize that interface add that no repository bin so it will not create the object for that for which in, because someone if i have my own interface which is implementing or extending to jpa repository or cloud repository then why to create the object for cloud repository why to create the object for jpa repository just directly create the object for my interface if my interface also has another child class uh with let's say we are inheriting some property from our parent class so directly use at the rate no repository bin on top of on top of our parent interface as well so that only spring will instantiate the child interface only right perfect yes this is what i want to hear hopefully uh, this is going to help you guys and this is one of the very popular interview questions what lavanya answered beautiful okay, thank you very much lavanya next question here tell me the limitation of java config file 
Let okay, tell me what is it? What eleven? Yeah, when, whenever you see my voice is breaking and whenever you see, you know, the videos are getting a little blurry, uh, just let me know, right? So that you know, I will take necessary steps. Also, I'm recording it from a different camera, but that will give me a lot of work. You know how lazy I am to do editing and all, right? Yes, Abhilash. Now, uh, now clear. For Amy, you are good, but for the first time when I saw you, it was much more clear than this. The the only thing I feel is that oh, the first okay. time I see. Sometimes your movement yeah, is right. a bit lagged like this. Yes. Okay. Okay. So now, do you feel it's okay or? Okay. 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 Do you want to capture sure. and send it to you the image that I see? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Sure. Put inside so that I can see it. Mm. Is, it is it manageable or not manageable? Yes. Yes. Manageable. And the voice is very clear. No, a little blurry, huh? Mm. That's a little bit. Little bit manageable. Okay. Yes. The next question will be, what do you mean by a Java config file in Spring? Okay, tell me a bit of advantages of it, little bit, if you're comfortable. Okay. And tell me, okay. what are the limitations of Java config file in Spring? Okay, and do we need to use a Java config file in Spring or we should avoid it? Go ahead. Okay, okay. first Java configuration is we are giving all the configuration details or the metadata of all the classes in a one Java class dot Java file that is called Java config and that class to be annotated with at the rate configuration. This class is considered to be as a Java config class and we can define the beans uh, what what the spring beans definition can be given inside this configuration class with the help of at the rate bean. So the uh, you can you can annotate the service, you can annotate the controller classes and all uh, other uh, DAO implementation classes and everything in that um, in that um, Java class itself. So what are all the advantages I see is in the XML what we do we we actually create a bean tag open tag close tag and we have to write many uh, many kind of uh, names or attribute names in it so here that is not needed with the help of other bean we can easily create an object and we can name the bean easily with the help of the attributes like uh, other bean open and we can give a name to it and with, a, with defining this uh, all the beans in a java class we can restrict we can get hold of the beans like we can we can make use of other conditional annotations like conditional on bean conditional on missing bean kind of thing and we can actually uh, uh, we can actually have get a hold when that object can be instantiated we can we can make put some conditions to the spring container on the bean creation uh, then what I see, uh, it's a readability, it's a readability and we can have multiple configuration files as well and we can interdepend them by adding it as one of the dependencies. So uh, here the Java compiler put a constraint whether this configuration file is uh, not final and it is uh, inside the package. So we need not to worry about whether we can uh, inject, uh, inject, add as an uh, add another configuration file to the parent to this configuration file. And we can also import any XML uh, defined configuration files also in this Java config with the help of other eight import resource. Uh, the limitations, what I see is we cannot I need to add one more advantage, Lavane, before we go for the limitation. I think you've covered everything. One important thing, Lavane, you said, no, we are using add bean and add bean uh, tag. Uh, sorry, bean tag in your XML, right? And let's say your one bean got a dependency, then how you are injecting the bean? You are using a ref. You remember the from your own? Yeah, properties of ref tag we are using and we are, we are giving the object. But in the ref, 
we can give anything we can give any bean object and it will not complain it will compile fine in the runtime only it will give you error but yeah. whenever you are using azure at bean and whenever you are doing java configuration let's say for dependency injection what you will do you will create constructor or inside the method parameter you will be you will be having the arguments and whenever you will be injecting any other bean there then it will be giving compile time error right the code only will not be compiled that okay the reference is for of this class you are injecting the bean or injecting the object of another class the com java compiler will only complain so the compile time check will be there but in um, xml any dependency if you are injecting let's say class is xyz you are injecting the object of uh, let's say fff then also it will compile right so yes sir yeah so this is one more advantage now coming back to the limitation part go ahead yeah limitation what i see is we cannot um, have this configuration class as final because um, the the cg lib of the spring framework will create a subclass of this configuration class and they will take the ownership of uh, when to when to call the actual spring bean definition method and when to create a proxy bean in it so uh, perfect yeah final because final. the java config file we create we define beans in that the things that you have mm -hmm. told but actually the that class will not be invoked what can you tell me why lavanya so guys you know uh, just want to repeat lavanya's point what she said is absolutely perfect that java config file will contain bean and that that particular class will not be invoked directly we will be creating proxy out of it right we will be creating proxy out of it and the proxy class will take the control of create creation of the bean so it will be only invoking the beans right so the proxy will do the job now uh, if you are making your class as final then cg leave has the limitation that it uh, obviously it need to extend the class and it need to override the methods so if the class is marked as final or if any of the methods are also marked as final there is one more point the methods also cannot be final if either the class no, or the no. methods then it cannot be extended or it cannot be overridden because the cg leave with the way it creates the proxies it extends to a class only then it overrides the method and give the implementation it will call your bean method only but before that after that it will do some checks now i want to hear what checks to checks of the proxy class implementations okay of, of the proxy class something okay. one little thing lavanya missed yeah. okay. okay i'll ask you one thing lavanya tell me uh, what is the default scope of a bin singleton perfect what about someone will keep on invoking a bin for many times then how many bins will be created many bins yes it will violate the singleton because property right because the default is singleton so that's why they are creating the proxy and creating the bean which is singleton they are making so that it is singleton so next time also if something will happen that restriction is there that you cannot create many unless your voice got stuck oh mm -hmm. voice got stuck yes if someone from there from there okay now it's fine lavanya yes yes now it's fine all right so from where i need to repeat someone like uh, for the singleton class to not to breach the singleton property perfect, perfect. Boot from there yeah so yeah um, so that's what i'm saying lavanya so basically if you have the singleton like in you know, a spring default scope is singleton so you know um the proxy is there to check if the singleton property is getting violated right so if it is getting violated then you know it will just throw us exception that okay the default scope of the bean has been marked as a default scope of singleton you cannot create many beans out of this that's why you know we got a proxy class and the proxy class override your bean methods and execute and creates bean out of that but it also make sure to do some validation checks like whether the singleton properties are not getting violated and there are some other things also we will not get into that two limitation i'll be taking out of your conversation uh, class cannot be final method cannot be final and one more thing lavanya if you have many uh, and many classes then that particular mm -hmm. file will be messy isn't it like you will be keep creating many bean definitions but one good thing you have told lavanya i want to bring that to the notice i haven't uh, interrupted then at component and at bean you have separated this beautifully 
I want you to talk a little bit about that. What is the difference between uh, Etheret component or what is the difference between creating a bean with Etheret component annotation and creating a bean with Etheret uh, bean annotation? Okay, you have told about that a little bit. Now tell a little bit more, Lavani. Okay, both the similarities is like both will be managed by Spring Container and both will undergo the life cycle of Spring Bean. Both will be undergo. There is no difference. The difference what I say is when we annotate a class with other it component and other it service or other it controller, it generally creates a bean conditionless with conditionless. So the beans which uh, which are created with other it service or component will be unconditionally it will be created. But when we define a uh, when when we have uh, the bean with uh, when we have a method which is annotated with other rates other it annotation bean we can use any conditions on top of it like at the rate condition on missing bean at the rate on condition on class for example the spring also uses at the rate enable auto configuration and it uses all these conditional annotations in order to instantiate any bean like dispatcher servlet or view resolver or any JPA entity manager factory or JPA repositories, everything has uh, used this other eight conditional annotations to in order to instantiate it being as a spring being. Perfect. Perfect. So basically, you know, you said that at the rate component means at the rate service means at the rate control means directly bean will be created. Here in the configuration file, if you are annotating at the rate bean, that means you are taking control by using condition. Like, you know, when the bean, either the bean need to be created, if that class is present, then create the bean. If this class is not present, then create the bean. If this bean is present inside the application context, then only create the bean. You can have many conditions out of that. Perfect, Lavanya. I'll tell you a lot of, a lot of people have this problem, um, you know, when they, they have been asked the same questions, like, you know, tell me the difference between creating a bean using this and that. Okay, let me tell you, there is no electricity right now. I'm comfortable. Okay. Comfortable. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm comfortable. I'm comfortable. Uh, there is no air conditioner running, but everything else is fine. Okay. If I'll be feel a little uncomfortable, then I'll tell you. Okay. Because it's yes. midnight right now. People who are watching is midnight for me. It's right now 1246. Okay. Well, yes. but I'm pretty fine. I'm thinking to go for uh, three hours coding after this. Oh. <laughs> All right. So um, I think I'm okay. Okay, I'm having fun, Lavanya. Let me tell you very honestly, yep. we, mm. you are doing a very good job. Okay, next question. So, the next question I'll ask you tell me what do you mean by bean post processor in spring? Bean post processor. Okay, bean post processor. Oh, no, no, no. don't tell me about bean post processor. Tell me about bean factory post processor first. Okay. Bean factory po po post processor is an interface which has a method post process uh, bean. So here okay. we, when a class, we can create a class, we can implement this interface. And when we implement this interface, all the classes which we implemented this interface will be uh, instantiated very first by the application context. And we can get the control into that class. And what basically this interface works on customizing the metadata, basically the Java configuration or the XML, uh, whatever the bean definitions we, we uh, defined in it. So uh, its feature is nothing but it can, it can change the metadata, but it can have the bean definitions loaded into it, but not the bean is instantiated. Perfect. So, here, what the feature, what we can do is we can override, we can give any other implementation to a bean, whatever, apart from whatever we have defined in the main Java config. And we can make use of um, uh, matching the runtime values from dot property files. That also we can do it. Uh, yes, all these things. And one of the disadvantage, what I see is uh, you cannot uh, make the bean to instantiate there because uh, on doing that, it will not be uh, going through the proper life cycle of spring bean. Basically, it will not go through the post uh, construct yeah. and pre destroy methods. So, this when is that is called premature. Perfect. Yeah. So, bean post processor comes before the bean get initialized, isn't initialized. it? Yes, bean factory post processor comes before. Yes. Sorry, bean factory post processor comes before the spring before. got initialized. 
And after the spring got initialized, if you want to do something, then you go for bean posh processor. Yes. Instead of bean factory posh processor. Okay. Bean factory posh processor is like you know metadata control. What new properties if you want to add, if you want to control the definition of the bean. And so what you whatever you have inside your Java config file defined before that bean is getting created, you want to do certain stuff for that uh, or stuff with that particular definition of the bean then you want the bean to be created and after the bean is getting created if you want to take a hold of it then you go for the other one All right, so before we go for the next section of the interview, I think we haven't discussed much of coding related stuff right here. So I just want to give you a very quick walkthrough to the Bean Factory Post Processor example. Uh, well, ignore the project name, it should be Bean Factory Post Processor. So let me explain you that particular thing in a very little example. So imagine you've got a component called test. So right now I'll go to my test class and imagine it is annotated with a component annotation and it is getting scanned by the container. So let's say you got a config class, which is a Java config class. And as you can see inside this config class, uh, imagine you have a, a component scan annotation and inside this component scan, you are scanning all the packages, which is starting from com, right? So in this case, the test will be scanned and the bean will be created by the container. But let's say before the bean will be created by the container, I just want to control the bean definition. I just want to control like what will be the scope of this bean or whether the lazy need to be uh, set as a true or a false. I, I want to set the auto aware candidate. I want to change the definition of the bean. And if I want to do so before the initialization of this particular bean, before my container creates this particular bean, I can trigger uh, a bean factory post processor. So I can create a class and this class name will be a custom bean factory post processor let's say okay and this class is right now going to implement to an interface and this is going to be an interface called bean factory post processor okay and right now this offers you a method which is going to be a callback method will be automatically called by your framework and this will be automatically called whenever your container will be started and right now you got a bean factory in the argument so right now from this bean factory you can ask this bean factory to get all the bean definitions and there you go bean definition names just get me all the bean that you got as a definition and now I will be having hold to the all the beans that I got inside my container. And um, right now what I can do, uh, I got a string array over here. So I can do a for each loop, I can iterate over this bean, let's say a string bean definition name and I can iterate it over this array that I'm getting and I can get a hold hold to all the beans that my container got to create. So let's say I'll be doing the bean factory and I can just do get bean definition and I can pass this bean definition name right over here that is going to get me the definition of a particular bean. So if I'm going to do a assign statement to a local variable as you, as you can see this is where you got the bean definition of a specific bean and you got you can you can manipulate it in any way for now let me just simply print this bean definition and let's see that what is going to happen so sorry this bean definition let me print it over here and there we go let me start my application and to start my application i got a main class called a app java and inside this main class let me just format it a bit and let me create a application context so application context context is equal to new uh, annotation config annotation config application context and right here 
I will be reading my config file and in this case my config file is this one app config .java, right so copy this guy go to my app .java and do app config dot plus and right now do a right click run as java application and i'm expecting here that my custom bean factory to trigger and right now my custom bean uh, factory post processor is not triggering and I was expecting that this particular method will be called automatically and it is going to print all my bin definitions right to the console but it did not happen because we did not initialize this particular bin and in order to initialize it right now I'll go to my config file and I'll create a bean for this I'll do public uh, what is that custom bean factory post processor this particular class that i have created and i'll create a um, you know bean for this and i'll do return a new custom bean post uh, factory post processor i'll make it a bean and i'm gonna say it a bean there we go but also i'll make sure this bean should be initialized before any of my beans any other beans if i got any other beans right over here if those beans are defined over here before all those beans this bean need to be triggered and to make it happen i'm gonna make it static and right now i feel this bean will be created first before any other beans created and right now i will go to my app.java do a right click run is java application and i was expecting that all my beans to be triggered over here and as you can see right now is printing uh, this for loop that we have designed right now is basically doing its trick and right now we are printing all the bean definition and if you want to see there are few bean definitions as you can see these are all framework related classes but if you want to see here you got your class as well which is a test class you remember this is the test class we had in the first we have designed this component which is this one and right now you can see the definition of the test class like the scope is singleton and the abstract is false the lazy init is null auto wear mode is zero and dependency check is zero all this definition that you are seeing all these things you can actually um you know it, it can change it you can manipulate this particular thing for an example if you want to change the definition of this test class and you want to change the scope to prototype you want to change the lazy init to let's say something else let's say true then how can you do that you can go to your bean factory post processor and you got you got to go to your post processor bean factory and right here let's say i'm printing all the definition here and now i can do a check i can do if and i can just do let's say if this bean definition that we are getting if this bean definition uh, dot get bean class name okay dot uh, contains or dot ends with okay if the bean class ends with this one test let's say bean uh, this this one ends with test let's say if we are having like because we're gonna be having many bean definitions name and we'll be looping over all the bean definition name but I want to change uh, the definition of the bean test and this is the name of the bean so i'm just checking that if the bean class name is test and right now i can manipulate it like i can do bean definition okay dot set and you can see you can set a lot of different things let's say i want to set this particular scope that i got over here i can just do set scope and i can set the scope to let's say a prototype previously it was singleton and i'm changing it to prototype so let me say proto type okay and let's say uh, previously the lazy init was null i want to change it let's say bin definition and i want to change the lazy init okay and i want to set it to true initialize it lazily um so if i want to do all these things i did um change the you know uh, definition of the bean called test right now let me print it again let me copy this and let me just print it after this if ends and right now if you're going to go over and relaunch your program you'll be seeing uh, where is my test now look at that previously it was singleton now we have changed it to prototype and the lazy init is true perfect so what we understood here is that before the bean got initialized you know we can take the control and we can modify a bean definition of a bean like this this test and the way it will be initialized the way the auto aware candidate will be set what scope it will have all the things we can change and control 
by using the custom bean factory post processor okay that we have designed which is which is implementing the bean factory post processor hope it makes sense so we have a very amazing first half of this interview and looking forward to have a very amazing second half by discussing a lot more interesting questions with lavanya but i think it's time to take a break so if you are tired enough here we go you can take a break right now and come back whenever you are ready and can enjoy the second half of this interview so you can safely pause this video right now grab a cup of coffee and enjoy the rest part of this interview right after a break Recording in progress. All right, started the recording, Lavanya. I think to get over it, I am recording here in the Zoom. I'm recording from my camera. I'm recording from my Camtasia. Recording from my webcam as well. Okay. So one recording okay. will get right. <laughs> so we are on internet. <laughs> so all uh, all the security pro the filter chain is in place. So yeah, yeah, security process. filter chain in place. So. <laughs> If one will bypass, then one will attack, right? Yes. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> good. So that brings me to security filter chain, but I'll not be asking you that. You are pretty good on that. <laughs> All right. So Village. yeah. So Lavanya, let's go for the next okay. question. Tell me, Lavanya, about the transactional propagation. This, whatever you understand about the at transactional annotation. and tell me what do you understand about transactional propagation right a little bit like you know i just want to hear like you know, what is it okay mm -hmm. so basically a trade transaction has so many features in it so mm -hmm. first when when we can annotate this a trade transactional on top of a class and on top of a method for example when we have a method annotated with a trade transactional and all the method execution will be taken care by internal proxy classes so oh. so for example if we have a controller service and repository and we have a trade transactional in the service layer so oh. there will be a class that stands in between the controller and the service so that class will start the transaction and call and put the entire method in that transaction and then it will uh, once after the commit or once after the execution of the queries are done with the help of the repository calls everything will be committed by this class so so this will so take care of the which proxy is that lavanya which, which proxy is that dynamic proxy dynamic proxy and who manages this which module of spring a spring transaction or spring that data jp that proxy that was gets created which proxy is that dynamic proxy uh, invocation handler invocation handler interceptor aspect <laughs> aspect aspect right? jweaver aspect jweaver or spring aspects spring aspects so spring eop basically manages this okay. cross cutting concerns because transaction a uh, transaction is a cross cutting concern we don't need to write those transaction in the beginning of every method or in the end of every method rather a proxy is just said that is going to be involved with this and the proxy will be taking care of calling your service method or your repository method and on top of that it will start the transaction and it will commit the transaction right if something goes back or something goes wrong it will roll back the transaction so nothing bad will happen in case of any exception occurs which kind of exception run time or compile time run time exceptions what what will happen if it will throw any compile time exception so compile time exceptions we, we should handle it we like, should handle it let's say i'm throwing some exception which is not run run time and i'm not handling it i'm throwing it to some other method and let's say the method which is calling the method uh, that is also throwing that particular method to some other method then what will happen if it, if so i want to hear that if the exception which is occurring inside your method if that is not a 
run time exception then do you think your transaction will be rolled back no it will not be rolled back so yeah. when compile time issues happens it will not uh, the the, ex, the basically the exception will not be propagated to that proxy layer the proxy class layer okay so you are saying it, the at transactional annotation only will roll back the transaction if it is a run time exception so at transaction will not roll back if it is a uh, you know if it is a normal exception which is not run time correct yes i will okay perfect i understood that particular thing transaction means wrapping out something under a transaction block so if something goes wrong it will be rolled back now here comes to the propagation level that we can define along with our at transactional annotation you know right inside the at transactional annotation parenthesis we can define the propagation now tell me first thing what do you mean by transactional propagation in one word okay so basically this propagation means carry forwarding the opened transaction or the current transaction to the next level like awesome. the the next level basically from service to repository hmm. so this transaction like should re reusing the transaction transaction reusing the current transaction and there are various kinds of propagation levels also there so uh, one of that is require the default is required requires a new requires new in the sense for example if we have a service and there we have other transactional and that calls an interface utility method and that that is repository utility method and that repository also is annotated the method is also annotated with other transactional with propagation level as uh, requires new so in this case what happens though we have any uh, transaction is on active transaction is available that will not be taken into consideration and we will create a new transaction and will commit everything inside that transaction basically all the statements which are in, the, in that method will be executed in a new transaction not the existing one okay. so we have uh, next one is uh, mandatory so mandatory in this mandatory propagation level that should always be a exception uh, sorry active transaction be available at this point of time when whenever there is no exception in the active sorry active transaction is available in the repository it throws an exception so that is mandatory um, so yeah. mandatory means so lavanya one transaction need to be there before you call that particular method method non transactional method is calling a method which is uh mark death at transactional propagated propagation level is mandatory then it will throw an exception so an exception so there is no active transaction is there okay. you also explained about the requires new requires new means even though the service method which is calling a repo method you have given an example they said both the service method and the repo method is marked as at transactional uh, but the repo method has been marked as at transactional requires new then what will happen when the service method will be start then obviously the transaction will start but when the service will call the repo at that time even though there is a already active transaction as we as our repo method is annotated with at transactional propagation label is requires new it will create a new transaction instead of using the service method which transaction that created right instead of using the current transaction it will create a new it will create uh, the new transaction right okay. the default one is required required means okay you haven't explained the required a little bit explain me the required uh, propagation label what do you mean by required let's say there okay. is method a method b method a is annotated with at transaction method b is also annotated with at transaction only you said even though you are not defining anything the default will be required right propagation label will be required so what will happen what will happen a is calling b all right both are marked with at transaction at transactional then tell me uh, what will happen so, so both both of the methods are transactional propagation level is required so mm -hmm. first when we uh, when we call this service method there will be a transaction will be created object will be created and that's the active transaction available so when a service call the repository method which is also annotated with other trans transactional it, it uses the active transaction which is provided by the service and uh, tries to pull in all the method x statements into that transaction and once for all it will commit perfect now i have a question here if the service let's say method a is service method b is uh, your depository or dap let's say the service method or the method a now you can think like method a method b method a is calling method b method a is not annotated with at the rate transactional it is a non transactional method 
Now okay. method A is calling method B, but method B is annotated with a transactional propagation okay. label as required. You're right. Required. Now what will happen? It doesn't have an active transaction. Whenever method A calls the method B, method B will look for a transaction because required okay. will not create the new um, you know transaction you said at, at the first at the first transaction. It'll look for the active transaction. Let's say the active transaction is not available. Then what will happen? So it will create new one there. So see, when, whenever the service is so not providing any active transaction to the repository, it will uh, create a new transaction. That's what I want to hear. Can you tell me a last one I'll ask? Propagation label as not supported. What it will do? Okay. Okay, not supported. Correct. Here, for example, if we have a service which is annotated with at the rate transactional, and we have, and that method calls the repository um, repository method, which has annotated with at the rate transaction, propagation level is not supported. So in this case, the active can active transaction, the transaction is open and the service level itself. And when we call that method, it will throw an exception telling no transaction should be available when this uh, method is executing. Okay. So it will throw an exception in case if active uh, transaction is available at that moment, at that. Okay. Okay, what what I can do here? So if service, uh, if, if method A, which already okay. is under a transaction is calling okay. method B, which is marked as propagation level as not supported, not supported. then it will throw an exception okay. because a transaction which is already active is using that and it does not support any transaction. That is the use of not support, not supported, I believe. Now, what, what I will do here, if I want to avoid that scenario, I want if the active transaction is there, I just want to cancel that transaction or suspend that transaction and execute the transaction of the method B non-transactionally. I don't want to throw exception. In that case, which propagation I will propagation label I'll use? Even I don't remember. Never? Never, yes. Never, yeah. never I think never will do what? If any active transaction is there, then it will suspend it. And then it will just execute the method non-transactional. Perfect. We'll not get into that. Hey, guys, you know, if someone is hearing this conversation and getting mad, like, you know, what's happening here? Um, uh, we we are recording some sessions, Lavinia. Maybe your best lessons, I'll be pushing it to YouTube or to, or to some free repository, free playlist. Go and use it right there. Okay. Maybe okay. Um, check the description for links. And if the, if the links is not available, please wait for that. I don't know when I'll editing that and when I'll be posting it. So, okay. Now let's go for the next one, Lavanya. I have written something, proxy one. You have answered that transaction will use AOP proxy here. Perfect. Um, next, next the question, Lavanya. Tell me the difference between the update method and the merge method in Hibernate. Take your time, explain it. Okay, basically we have a session involvement in the hibernate. So when we want to update any row, any row value in a table, first we will we would like to load that particular row as an entity into a session. We basically load that object into a session and we make that object dirty. Dirty means we would like to change the state of that object. It is changing a value of the attribute from A to B. So whenever we are again adding uh, that is session dot update and push the dirty object into that session again, the automatic dirty checking will be happening in the framework level. That means uh, all the attributes of both the objects, the session load uh, objects previously loaded objects and the, the objects we changed the state. So both will be compared at granular level like each of the attributes will be compared and the updated value that is the value which we have changed will be patched up on the value the already the session hold uh, was holding it so and then on flush it will directly uh, update the value onto the database so the this is update so consider a scenario this is i'm going to tell about the merge now so merge when we load a uh, object into a session. Say, for example, we are loading an employee object with ID 3. Oh, and suddenly okay. what we are doing, we are closing the session. We are closing the session. The object becomes a detached one with the session. 
and we are changing the state of that object. Say the employee name is changed from A to B. So now what we are doing, we are again opening a session and we are loading the same employee object from the database. So now that object will have only the old values, will have the old values. Now what we try to do, the, already the object which in a detached mode, we have it in a hand and we have a session which also has the object with the ID, the same ID. It's loaded from the DB and we try to update. We push dot update uh, with the detached object into that the newly created session. So here we encounter an exception telling uh, non-unique non object exception, non-unique object exception might occur. This is because the session cannot hold two objects with the same ID. Perfect. So here, if we add dot merge, what, what happens? All the, the detached objects update what we have done on the, and the detached object will be patched up on the object which the session holds. And on flush, it will be flushing the values into the database. And on commit, it will be completely committed. Yes. Look, guys, you know, I've explained the same concept in a session taking one and a half hour. Oh. Say, explain it in 50, 15 minutes, five, three minutes, right? Perfect, Lavanya. Someone getting confused with this explanation, please go and watch that one and a half hour video and come back and listen to this. This is going to make perfect sense. I think Lavanya, I have pushed that particular session to YouTube already. Someone is watching this video as a paid uh, video in some paid playlist. Uh, go and check your uh, Spring and Hibernate Bootcamp only. We have pushed it. Yes. So yes. Uh, watch the update versus March. Maybe the lesson four or lesson five in Hibernate, isn't it, Lavanya? Yeah. Yes. Just go and watch for that. The one takeaway, Lavanya, one line I want to wrap up. One session containing two objects, and all the two objects will have the same primary key or the same ID. That time, the session will be confused like, okay, which one I want to update, either this one or this one. We will say, hey, most of the leaf. Abhilash, your, your screen is stuck. Okay. Uh, now, now good? Now good, Lavanya? No, 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 no. Okay. Uh, now good, now good, now good. Maybe it's just flickering a little bit. All right. Mm. Perfect. Fine. Um, perfect answer, Lavanya. But you didn't finish it, I think. That, uh, that is, last... is fine. You have already answered it. It's good. Whatever you said. Okay. Um, okay. One more springboard question, Lavanya. Here to hear this question a little carefully. You got two files. Application uh, properties file and application.yaml file. You know that you can configure Spring Boot pro properties using either application.xml, uh, application.yaml, or application.properties file, or you can use Java command line arguments or Java environment variables to control the Spring Boot properties, right? Now I have a question. Let's say you got two files. Either you can use application.yaml or you can use application.properties that the application.properties file and application.yaml file you can think like the using both we can configure our spring boot project but my question here is that a developer either need to choose a application.yaml or a application.properties in order to work in the spring project let's say i'll be putting both of the both of this file application.yaml application.properties both of the files are in my spring boot a class path where the file will be automatically detected because you know, right? This file will be automatically loaded in Spring Boot application. We don't need to load it separately. And my question here is that if you got both the files inside the class path, so do you think your application will start, your Spring Boot application will bootstrap or it will fail? Fail to bootstrap. Oh no, I, I think the, it will start the application properly. It will not uh, fail. Then let's say uh, I have a property uh, in the application or properties file called name equal to Lavanya. Okay. okay. And I have the same property in the YAML file called name equal to Abhilash. Okay. okay. And the application mm -hmm. start. Now mm -hmm. I'm trying to access the value of name in my one of my java class using add value annotation and i'm trying to print it now okay. spring will print lavanya or avilash avilash is in um yaml file yeah, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, let's say avilash is in yaml file lavanya is in properties file then which one will be uh, there in the console which value will be printed 
the dot property files are black lavanya exactly so first yml then the properties right properties, the properties mm -hmm. file will get the priority because it will be loaded by spring boot later okay mm -hmm. So yes. YML will be loaded first, then the properties file of it. So I'll go for the next question. Um, so I think uh, I, I'll ask one more question, Lavanya. Tell me how is dispatcher servlet in Spring Boot got set okay. up? Okay, how the setup for dispatcher servlet happens? I'm actually trying to ask you about the auto configuration, how the auto configuration works in Spring Boot. Uh, I'm just tweaking, uh, twisting this particular question a little bit and want to know how the dispatcher servlet is getting into track or getting into action in Spring Boot because we are not defining it by ourselves. Can you please tell me like how this auto configuration happens? Okay. So in a Spring Boot project, we always add the dependency, starter dependency. For awesome. web application, mm -hmm. we will, uh, in order to create a web application, we add Spring Boot's web starter as a dependency. And this dependency has a Spring Web dependency, the transitive dependency will fall in place into the class path. So we have dispatcher servlet, servlet context, the Java X servlet API will also be part of this dependency and everything will be in our class path of our application. So what happens when we, create the Spring Boot application, there are three annotations to be uh, added to the main file. The one is other Spring Boot configuration, enable auto configuration and the component scan. All will come uh, together when we add a other Spring Boot application. So this enable auto configuration, what it does, it is, um, uh, this is basically from a Spring Auto Configure uh, dependency project. Okay, mm -hmm. we have a spring.factories uh, file wherein, all the con uh, all the auto configuration beams should be created. No, all these classes will be part of that file. So, for example, dispatcher Wait, servlet file will be available. Meta inf uh, spring dot factories in uh, spring auto wire project auto configure project. Yeah, auto configure project meta inf folder INF. spring dot factories file. Dot factories. There you got enable auto configuration and then continue. Yeah. Yes, we have enable auto configuration and inside that all the auto configuration classes, for example, dispatcher servlet auto configuration and into JPA repository auto configuration and um, internal view resolver auto configuration. As part of Spring MVC, we used to create the dispatcher servlet and the internal view resolver as a beams here. So what it does, it will go to the, we, we, we have already all fallen place like uh, all the auto configuration classes are in the class path. So here we have at the rate conditional statements again, conditional annotations again. So at the rate for in the dispatcher uh, servlet auto configuration class, there will be a annotation called at the rate conditional on class dispatcher servlet dot class. What it means is Basically, it scans whether the dispatcher servlet dot class is available in our project. If it has, it tries to create one and configure it with application context. And that also, and the, this dispatcher servlet will also be configured with the servlet context. So oh. this way, the dispatcher servlet object is instantiated. There will be also some other conditions along with that. That's fine. That's fine. Perfect. Okay. So it's all basically happens through the auto configuration. Okay. When it detects the Spring Web MVC project in the class path, I got a question here. What will happen if the Spring Web MVC project will not there in the class path? Then, okay. then, then will... the web application context will be created or no, it will not be created? No, it will not be created because th there is no dispatcher uh, servlet bean will be created. As there is no context will be created or it will not be created? Application context. Yes, application context, it might uh, create uh, the beans. It will be created. It will be created. If the dispatcher servlet is not there, there will be a normal, uh, what is that? Annotation configuration application context. Uh, Remember annotation the, config. Yeah, yes, uh, spring is, yeah, that application context will be created. created. If it is there, this web, web MVC uh, thing is there, then the dispatcher servlet will be created. Although web application, application context will be created. If there is a, another one, if the reactive spring you are using, if you are having web flux, then there is a reactive spring application context will be created. Based on the dependencies, Spring Boot is smart enough which application context to create and the developer doesn't have any role. 
which is a pretty stupid statement to say because if your client want you to configure it you need to configure it so you also need to learn how to configure dispatches okay. of it by yourself don't depend on spring boot is good so, so for, like you know so far so good you know if you are using it properly and if there is no customization needed otherwise you know uh, yeah i already i already told you guys right the manual car and the automated car you need to learn how to drive a manual car before you try to jump into okay. an auto automated car driving yes, yes. perfect okay. the next question i want to ask you lavanya here i think i have covered pretty much everything i want to go for a question okay i'll ask you a tough question at last and then we'll wrap up uh before i wrap this off uh tell me how you create java exceptions a simple java exceptions okay. tell me in one line okay. uh that extends exception class check okay. exception uh, tell me in two lines then what will be the next one so for unchecked exception uh i'll extend the runtime exception and we create a constructor with any uh string Perfect. the custom you way we can to, you'll extend to the runtime exception exception or, you need to override a con, the super constructor in it yeah perfect okay so tell me what is the difference between you know checked exception and unchecked exception in java okay checked are like uh, compile time exceptions for example file not wrong if we give any path which uh, in the compile time it tries to uh, validate it so at the time we might there might be file that may not be present in the given path so file not wrong would be the compile time exception and unchecked are the runtime exceptions the arithmetic array index out of bound exception and the spring all the spring exceptions like spring bean creation exception all these are runtime exceptions perfect perfect how will you handle exceptions in spring spring okay handling expert, uh, exceptions okay uh, normally we have uh, we uh, actually handle this exception with annotation called at the rate exception handler and we okay. define a handler method under it and it takes a parameter also what kind of exception it will handle okay. and we can get hold of that exception and we can uh, for we can format it in whichever way we want like uh, we can have a a, uh, a basic or a, a model for handling the exception with uh, the field okay so service exception yeah we can create a model like you know which will have the response type the exception date and everything and we can return that same object as part of the exception so the client will get the response with all the glory details about the exception exception perfect we can use that using the exception handler method handler. now given yeah the exception handler method where you will be keeping you will be keeping it inside a controller or where you will be keeping the exception all so, the exception handler methods that you have yeah all the exception it is it is uh, it is it's not okay to keep it in the controller level at the global level we can take it and we can uh, define a class wherein all we can have all the uh, exceptional handler methods in it to pick to actually make the class to work globally we have to add another annotation called at the rate controller advise on top of it Perfect. to yes. uh, to actually get hold of the exception whenever the service or the controller throws an exception and handle it perfect so instead of putting our exception related code inside the controller itself what we can actually put there is obviously we can put it there will be no compile time issue we can move it to the global level using global the add controller level. advice advice what is the difference between add controller advice and add rest controller advice oh yes okay so here the response body at the rate response body plus at the rate controller advice is equivalent to the at the rate rest controller advice it will normally return a, as a response awesome. whatever we give it it will be writing into http servlet response so this is the same thing only right uh, okay perfect good so yes. okay one last question in this topic what will happen if Okay. what will happen if your rest service is okay. returning some exception like bad gateway like you know your client is trying to connect to a external rest service but that it is not able to connect it is not able to do a handshake okay or it is trying to connect to a external rest service it is able to connect but some timeout is happening some read timeout is happening or some write timeout is happening okay then what will happen 
then how will you handle that will that will that when that exception will occur do you think it will go to the controller advice or it will not go there it will not go to the controller advice actually exactly so, so we, we can uh, we can actually have response error handler in it yes 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 yes, yes. so, so like this response error handler is an interface which has two methods in it uh, one is has error and another one would be handling the error handle error so this um, for example we call uh, any rest services with other rest template and that throws any gateway exception in it we can get hold of that exception in the uh, other rate response error handler class so basically oh. we can check the exception occurrence based on the http status that we get it so there is also one helper class like default response error handler through which we can actually uh, detect whether the error http status is um, not 200 it's either 500 or 400 so with the help of that uh, we can catch the exception and customize the exception in the handle method and again here we can throw our custom exception and again we can handle it in a global handler uh, which is annotated with other rate controller advice perfect good job lavanya perfect answer thank okay. you so uh, the next one lavanya okay let's wrap it up but let's have a healthy 5 minute 5 minute on discussion on this tell me lavanya what do you mean by thread local in java normal plain java what do you mean by thread local okay and then we will discuss about the what is the real time uses of thread local and if you have ever seen the uses of this in any of the framework like spring hibernate or any of your java frameworks or if you are doing it in your real time projects that you are working on right now just give me some instances like okay obvious this is where the thread local is getting used okay please continue okay so thread local is considered to be as a memory which is available to all the threads okay so when we take any console application any java application our main thread is a thread which has a local memory in it and that memory is called thread local thread local is specific only to that thread for example if a thread we can even have variables or any kind of object reference to a thread local and it will be bounded only to that thread though two threads are accessing the same object they can have the variable same but they cannot see each other one oh. thread thread local will not be visible to the other thread so this is the this is my understanding of thread local and uh, it is also can be considered as a scope like we see the request scope session scope in spring so this also considered to be as a one of the scope so i see this as per, uh, the c in the web application when we have a uh, spring security also part of it so mm-hmm. i would like to tell the cycle abilash so yes. where i saw so mm-hmm. when we deploy a application which has a security implemented in it the web server when when we hit a web request the request comes and hit the web server and the web server assigns a thread to each and every request that comes in a request hit the web service web server and the web server creates a thread for the request and that mm-hmm. goes through authentication filter and the filter will create a authentication object so i take username password authentication token which is a authentication object here we have the user name which we uh, with the user entered and the password and also a couple of uh, attributes in it for example it can have details details which hold the uh, the ip address of the client and the certificate that the client has uh and is authenticated is another attribute which will be by default false on the first hit then it goes to a authentication manager and the authentication manager uh, there is a implementation class for authentication manager is the provider manager what basically it does it tries to um, uh, delegate the token to all the available providers in our project for example there can be many available providers the username password um, uh, authentication provider is one by default the next one can be basic authentication provider the phase authentication provider thumb authentication provider these are all the custom authentication providers that we can have in our application so this token will be moved to all the providers method called supports 
and the supports method detects whether this object can be validated by this provider or not so i have taken username password authentication uh, token as uh, as my object and the username author uh, username password authentication provider will say yes that it can handle that object all the rest of the provider returns false to the provider manager now this authentication this username password authentication provider will delegate this request to the further down level the use the user detail service which actually uses load user by username with the help of this the user credential we can load all the details of the user including the authorities or the rules um, then its password it can and the password encoder will also fall in uh, place and there will be a validation against the password entered by the user and the password which is stored either in the it can be any implementation in memory or jdbc or any ldap then on successful validating validation the 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 object the username authentication username password authentication token object will be marked authenticated that is the boolean attribute will be changed to true and they are and again it is given back to the authentication filter and from filter it goes to a, a holder a place called security context holder and this security context holder has the security context that is nothing but the username password authentication token mark authenticated and the scope of this object is thread local that is it is specific to that web request alone so if in case if another web request hits the server again the same uh, same path uh, goes on and it creates another username password authentication token and it be placed in a holder security context holder that mem that scope is also called thread local so the basic advantages of having it in a uh, it's um it's um having it in a thread is scope as thread local is we can handle this authentication object at any layer in our application either in the controller or in the service or even in the repository also if we need it to access so the the default scope of this uh, username authentication for the token or the servlet context is thread local and this is one of the practical implementation i see the implementation i see uh, okay. perfect one imp very very comprehensive and very nicely answered lavanya thank you very much for the detailed explanation yeah and i feel really good you know after i hear this language and explanation because i i feel no, very no. good <laughs> so yeah because thank you because of you obviously no, 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 i can tell you can edit that, if you want yeah, i am i'm enjoying this answer basically yeah thank you lavanya but yeah one thing i just want to point out maybe you have missed it but you know it that this this is very important to understand that uh, this security context holder data will be cleared by the framework because the basic scope of that is thread local so any thread local so it is not really recommended to create thread memories and make use of thread em, thread memories as a div you can do it of course but you know in framework label they utilize these things because imagine you know some users is authenticated right now let's say labanya is connecting to my web server then my web server has limited number of resources limited number of threads one thread is given to labanya she entered her username password and everything now labanya is logged in now my thread local is holding a object about labanya's information which is my authentication object now once labanya logs out once she is logged out it is important that we are clearing that authentication detail what will happen if a vilas is right now right now lavanya is logged out now it, it is very important that that when the response will go back the thread will clear that object which is uh, which is already holded by the thread previously which is lavanya's object otherwise let's say you know the web server has limited number of resources right now i am they say i am connecting to the web server now web server is giving me the same thread which he has given to lavanya before and it has not cleared the thread local memory previously then lavanya's cadence or lavanya's information will be already there so it will be if it will be given to me then it will be a mess it will be a complete stir right that is very important that the clearing is also happen like you know the thread clearing is also happen yeah very perfectly answered lavanya and yeah thread local means thumb memory that thread has internally it uses by the framework because 
framework because one important thing lavanya we both might have missed here that let's say in our dao layer in our repository layer in your service layer everywhere we need the information about the user so how you will be getting that object okay you will be asked to thread local so once the authentication object that you are telling lavanya once that object got created in security that has been kept in the thread local so any layer you want to access the thread acts to the security context holder uh, which is basically your thread local scope it has right the default scope will be thread local right but it has some other yes. scopes also maybe this is a question for yes, you guys so, yeah maybe let it for the people like who are hearing it if you know what are the other scopes are there for the thread uh, for our spring security context holder put it in the comment section one hint lavanya has given you already don't repeat it so yeah the <sighs> default will be thread local so you know that will be there in the thread in your service repository any place you want to access that object just do security context holder get context dot get authentication object it will get you back the authentication object perfect that is coming from the thread local only just remember this much perfect should i ask you more questions i think i am pretty happy with this much love and yeah and maybe a um, couple of coding questions i'll give you you we will do it later maybe we'll just um add to the end of this video okay and apart from that i don't think you made my job easy i don't have to do much of editing in this video honestly telling you lavanya <laughs> i've enjoyed it pretty much okay. asking you questions i can keep asking you for next couple of hours is 2 am already <laughs> no because i just sleep because uh, no, you i will be go i'll be go on coding for three more hours as i said lavanya because i got some client calls tomorrow and again some interview got okay. scheduled man maybe you know i'll just i'll see like you know what i can do right now um yeah thank you very much lavana it's a wonderful wonderful interview if you want to say me something you can say it right now yes. any feedback yes. anything um you want to give on the interview or anything you want to say you can say it and then we can wrap it up mm-hmm. no that's like uh, yeah i i just wanted to tell something to you not to the to, not to any but thanks a lot thanks a lot for uh, conducting this it uh, really motivated me to give clear answers all for all your questions and uh, you know that i'm i'm with you for last 6 months 6 or 2 7 months learning from the scratch of spring so really i got good hold about the spring java hibernate jpa jdbc <laughs> so it continuously goes on to be you are inspiration lavanya people who are having gap i think many of them lavanya to be very honest uh, especially from a uh, lot of female candidates i have yes. like who are who are like you know who are having gap you know after because of some or some some reason every day i receive calls you know but i have i can see like you know they already have the things you, you are going to be a motivations for a lot of them if they are watching it she has she has been con- to be very honest i am not praising her she is one of the very consistent uh, you know um, attendees of every meetings that we had she was pretty much consistent with her learning so that's it lavanya you don't you don't need to learn anything more just go and give interviews i'm sure you'll be cracking menis okay and just send me some sweets once you are done yeah, thank you thank Definitely. you lavanya thank you everyone thank you plus one thing you forgot to ask immutable and weak reference and soft reference and okay you know <laughs> Uh, we will do it. maybe yeah that is some that that is something i wanted to ask you yeah maybe we'll do it later lavanya yes um, yes uh cool i think we we are recording it for last couple of hours isn't it <laughs> mm yes yes sir it's 4:30 now oh, okay. i started at 2 o'clock perfect no problem thank you very much lavanya for attending the interview and i'll see you in the next not in the next video in the next lesson next class on next wednesday class. on wednesday we'll, on be, wednesday. Dis- oh, we'll be discussing wednesday you told to me yeah we'll be discussing advanced transactional annotations deep dive followed by the microservices okay. prerequisite okay bye bye lavanya okay. take care have a good bye, day Abilash. nice talk good night abilash good Thank day lavanya bye. bye take care bye